Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anand Jain. I am an assistant professor at Emory University in Atlanta and director of the esophageal disorders program there. Um, I'm going to be talking to you all about a topic that's uh, very important to me, um, which is esophageal motility disorders. And uh, I'd like to give this talk in the context of um, really the patient interactions that I've had over the years. So I, I want to answer you know, the questions that patients ask me, which are often the whys. Why do I have this disease? Why do I have these symptoms? Why do you recommend this treatment? Um, so that's kind of the, um, the, the framework of today's talk. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. I have no disclosures. So before we get into the disease states of the esophagus, it's important to just understand what the esophagus is. Um, you know, so what is it? So I'll, at first, I'll point you to this picture here. This is a sagittal view of the human thorax, um, where sort of you're cut, you're in over to the side and it's cut in cross section. Um, and at first glance, you don't actually see the esophagus. Um, and that's something I often tell patients, you know, the esophagus um, is actually normally a very thin and collapsed organ. So it's actually difficult to see. Now in the diagram, if you look right here, right in front of the spine, you will see this slender tube that kind of dives down and, and meets with the stomach. This is the esophagus. Um, the esophagus is really kind of wedged between the airway um, and the spine. Um, it's behind the heart. And what this picture doesn't show is the, the, two, the two lungs, your left and right lung, which are on either side of the esophagus. So just kind of to appreciate that it's actually a very small uh, part of your thorax. So what does it do exactly? So the esophagus really has two main functions. The first is that it is really a conduit or a passageway. Uh, for food and liquid to get from the mouth to the stomach. It's really, you know, a highway to the stomach, as the slide says. The other, passage, the other um, important property is that it protects, um, particularly the airway, against um, some contents that can come up from the stomach that could damage the airway, and those would be acid and bile. So what you'll see in the upcoming slides is that really the, the structure and function of the esophagus is, um, is completely uh, based on uh, function, these two functions. Um, so this slide, I want to go over the structure of the esophagus. So this is a cross section of the esophagus, really kind of what we would be looking um, at when we did an endoscopy, um, at least the luminal layer. So what you can see here, um, the hollowed area is the lumen. That's where food and liquid are passing through. Right around that, you see the mucosal layer. So this is the layer that's immediately in contact with whatever is passing up and down um, the esophagus. And then beyond that, you see some connective tissue layers, and then you see two muscle layers. You see a layer of circular muscle and a layer of longitudinal muscle. And as I mentioned, uh, peristalsis or you know, contraction of the esophagus to push food down is one of the main functions of the esophagus. So um, a lot of the pathology and a lot of the um, symptom generation is related to the muscles, whether they're functioning appropriately or not. This is a schematic of what those muscles actually do. So on the left, you can see this green um, sort of American football shaped um, uh, thing is the food bolus. So when you swallow, you'll see that the muscles behind the bolus squeeze or contract and the muscles in front or sort of around the bolus, they have to relax, accommodate it. Um, and that's sort of the fashion that food moves through the esophagus. A lot of people refer to this as the water balloon muscle. Um, and then you can see on the second picture that the food is passing in and getting into the stomach. I want to spend some time talking about a very important structure, um, which is the lower esophageal sphincter. You know, this is really um, important both from a, just a normal physiologic functioning standpoint and also from a disease standpoint, because a lot of the diseases um, have an issue uh, with the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter. So, you know, I, I talk about the lower esophageal sphincter as if, you know, it's this very obvious valve that I see when I, when I do an endoscopy. Uh, and the reality is it's not, you know, it's not like a heart valve. Um, we don't actually see a valve-like structure when we look at this area. Um, in reality, it's just an area of thicker muscle. So as you can see on this diagram here, the lower esophageal sphincter, the muscle of the esophagus is much thicker. Those muscle layers that I showed you earlier are much thicker in this area. 
The other important thing about the LES is that it is under very fine neurologic control. It's under very precise intrinsic and extrinsic neurologic control. And that becomes important when we talk about disease states. The other important part of not necessarily the LES, but um, sort of the barrier. So the barrier um, between the esophagus and the stomach, we call the EGJ or esophagogastric junction. So many of you may see that term used in your endoscopy reports or you know, in your ICD-9 codes. Um, so, so the esophagogastric junction is comprised not only of the LES, but also the components of the crural diaphragm. So the esophagus sits, as I mentioned, kind of in the middle with surrounded by the lungs, the heart and all these other organs and the diaphragm runs right below the esophagus. So the esophagus passes through that. Um, you know, that dome-like structure, which is the diaphragm. So all those ligamentous attachments um, that connect to the esophagus, they create resistance as well. And that's actually very important for normal function of the esophagus. These are the sorts of things um, that are affected when you have, for instance, a hiatal hernia or some surgical um, procedure in that area because those ligaments can get disrupted. So what can go wrong in the esophagus? Now that we have a little bit of an understanding of, of how the esophagus is supposed to function, let's talk about the potential problems. So you could have ineffective function of the muscles of the esophagus or the lower esophageal sphincter. You could have inflammation or injury to the lining of the esophagus or even some of the deeper layers. You could have an anatomic or abnormality causing obstruction. Um, I referenced a hiatal hernia. Um, you know, and really any other surgical area could also cause an obstruction. Um, tumors and cancer certainly is something that we all think about. And then I want to highlight this one, abnormal patient technique for swallowing and breathing, because this is actually an important cause of symptoms um, in esophageal diseases. So these are um, the actual diseases, or at least, you know, really the, the most important ones. Um, and this topic, this talk is really focused on esophageal motility disorders, uh, but I include these other diagnoses because it's important to understand esophageal diseases and symptom generation really as a whole, prior, rather than just focusing on motility disorders. Um, so the top three diagnoses here, achalasia, esophageal spasm, and um, sort of more nonspecific esophageal dysmotility, these are all problems with the muscular function or the LES, um, as we've alluded to. GERD or acid reflux, eosinophilic esophagitis, and esophageal stricture, these are really diseases that affect the lining or the mucosa of the esophagus. GERD meaning acid-related injury, eosinophilic esophagitis meaning a specific type of injury which is really food allergen mediated. Um, and either of those can cause stricture. You know, stricture really just refers to mucosal inflammation ultimately causing scar um, and a blockage. So that's what a stricture refers to. And then hiatal hernia and post fundoplication dysphagia refer to more anatomic issues. So we've talked about hiatal hernia a little bit and we're gonna talk about it some more. Um, and then post fundoplication refers to um, a surgical procedure. So a Nissen or other type of fundoplication, um, which we'll also talk about. But after that surgery, there can be um, some obstruction or blockage causing symptoms. And then there is a whole group of belching disorders. So this is when um, I was referring to patient behaviors with abnormal swallowing and belching. So there are actually several disorders of that that we're gonna talk about. The names of those are rumination and supergastric belching. Um, and then there's esophageal hypersensitivity. This refers to um, sort of a heightened response to whatever stimulus is going on in the esophagus um, and that itself causing symptoms or at least being the main driver of symptoms. And then there's esophageal cancer. There's really two main types, um, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell. So this is a question that patients always ask me. You know, it, Doc, is anything bad gonna happen to me? Um, what is gonna happen if I let these symptoms go on and on? Are we missing anything? Um, and these are the things that come to at least my mind, um, you know, in a lot of my patients' mind when, when I've uh, asked them. These are the things that we're worried about. Esophageal cancer, malnutrition, food impaction, which means that food is really jammed in the esophagus and you can't either get it down or spit it back up. Aspiration, which is when contents from the esophagus go into the lungs. Bleeding, 
So if you look at these five things, you know, there definitely is some risk of these things with um, really any of these esophageal conditions. However, for the most part, I try to reassure patients because it's really low. And the really uh, an important thing to understand is that particularly for cancer, um, endoscopy is extremely, extremely good at excluding that. So if you've had an upper endoscopy and it was normal or it did not show any findings concerning for cancer, um, really you can be rest assured that that is not um, what's going on, okay? Um, malnutrition really only happens with the more serious motility disorders um, such as achalasia. Um, food impaction can happen with a variety of disorders, uh, both motility, but also some of the stricturing diseases like eosinophilic esophagitis. So that is an important one to recognize. If you're having that, you need to let your physicians know. Aspiration is another one that can happen. It happens predominantly with motility disorders, but can happen with strictures as well, particularly if they're um, sort of high up in the esophagus. Again, something you want to let your physicians know about. And bleeding. Uh, major bleeding of the esophagus is pretty uncommon. Um, luckily, um, but there are a couple of diseases. You know, you could have high-grade reflux esophagitis. Um, you could have lesions within a hernia sac it's called Cameron's ulcers. There are a few things, but for the most part, the esophagus is really not a major source of GI tract bleeding. So now let's move on to generation of esophageal symptoms. So this is the thing um, that I probably spend the most time, um, you know, talking about when I meet a patient in person. Um, so what exactly is causing your symptoms? So the GI tract in general is a, mostly a hollow tube. Um, and the main stimulus for symptoms, particularly pain, is distension. So if you take the tube and you distend part of it, there are these um, sensors, these mechanical receptors in the walls and, and really in multiple layers of the lumen um, that sense that. And they sense that as pain, discomfort um, of some sort. So that's the main stimulus. And if you can imagine, if you have a blockage, let's say due to a scar tissue causing stricture, and you have food that is trying to pass through that area, um, and it can't, obviously that part of the esophagus is then going to distend and that's gonna cause pain or some sort of discomfort. Um, in the esophagus, there are a couple of other um, pathophysiologies that are relevant. One is spasm causing ischemia. So if you have a portion of your esophageal muscle that is contracting for a long period of time, it can actually cut off the blood supply um, to that area and that can cause pain as well. Um, and then there's sort of the mucosal injury. So there are these nerve endings in the mucosa of the esophagus that can sense things like acid um, or bile. And these are sort of responsible for um, symptoms such as heart. So some combination of these processes generates the symptoms that you as the patient experience, whether that may be dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, heartburn, regurgitation, chest pain, belching, hiccups. These are all things that can be related to your esophagus. Um, but, far, um, but, but much more probably relevant to you as the patient than the particular symptom is the overall symptom experience. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? So the symptom experience is what you as a patient go through on a daily basis. How much does this bother you? When the physician asks you that, um, this is what uh, we're referring to. Um, and I, I, I show this because um, there's an emphasis both from patients and from doctors to focus only on the physiologic or anatomic abnormality. So, um, you know, let's take uh, someone who again has a stricture. Um, let's say they have a stricture at the bottom of their esophagus um, and it's, it's not too tight, it's not too loose. It's what we'd call a medium grade stricture. Um, so you will realize that um, a medium grade stricture can have a very wide range of um, symptom experiences among patients. Some patients, it doesn't bother them at all. And some patients, um, they completely change their eating behaviors. They don't go out to eat at all. They don't socialize. Um, and, and probably the variable that accounts for that is the second bar here, um, which is tissue level sensitivity and central sensation handling. So um, each individual um, has a different level of sensitivity. Um, my esophagus may not feel a stretch of you know, 10 millimeters, um, but somebody's esophagus may feel a stretch of five millimeters and another person's may not feel a stretch until it's 15 millimeters. So um, there's variability in how sensitive those receptors in the esophageal, um, in the esophagus are. And then there is the link between the symptom 
and the, the mind. So it's what we call the brain gut interaction. So how are we processing those signals? Do we associate them with horrible things or do we sort of move about um, and we you know, understand that these are things that are happening and we're able to function? Um, so the combination of the physiologic abnormality and then these other factors is really what determines a patient's symptom experience. Um, and I really highlight this just to show that we have to focus on both if we're gonna deliver good care and have good outcomes for you all as patients. Um, so now let's jump to the actual treatment targets for esophageal disease. So what can we treat? Um, and, I, and I've you know, really done this slide several times, but I, I like to break it down like this, again, from a patient perspective. So there are medications, um, a category which I'll call, I call plumbing, which is probably overly simplistic, but I think that's um, you know, an accurate way of phrasing it. There's anatomical issues, patient behaviors, and then again, central sensation processing and coping. So when we talk about medications, everyone knows about proton pump inhibitors, your Prilosex, your Nexiums in that category. Um, there are also other medications we use for the esophagus. So we use mu muscle relaxants. So these, you know, these are muscle relaxants that are different than maybe you would get for your lower back or, or another muscle in the body. These are smooth muscle relaxants, which are designed to relax the esophageal muscle. So hyosamine or Levson, Nitrates such as you know nitroglycerin, isobil, um, calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem, and phosphodiesterase um, inhibitors such as uh, Viagra. Believe it or not, that one usually gets a chuckle, uh, but these can all affect um, and particularly they relax the smooth muscle of the esophagus. Um, and then there are these uh, medicines called neuromodulators. So these are specifically designed to reduce that sensitivity um, at the level of the tissue that I'm referring to. Um, some of these you may have heard of because they are um, technically antidepressant class, um, but we really don't use them for those for that purpose in the esophagus. So amitriptyline, nortriptyline is another one. Um, we use some traditional SSRIs or antidepressants, um, and then there are some other nerve-specific medications such as gabapentin and pregabalin. So now the plumbing. Um, so plumbing means, you know, there's a scar tissue or, um, causing a blockage, or there is some other type of muscular type of blockage. Um, and as may be intuitive, you know, if you have a blockage, you usually can open it up. Um, so there are several ways to do that. So if it's, um, if it's a scar tissue, dilation works quite well. So whether that's with a balloon or what we call a bougie, which is really a long, almost um, sort of a flexible sword shaped, um, you know, instrument that we pass over a guide wire. Um, and then if it's a muscle issue, that's when we have to consider injecting that muscle with Botox, um, the same Botox that is used for facial um, muscles and others um, is used and works very well in the esophagus if used for the right indication. Um, and then there are two other treatments specific to the muscles. One is called the pneumatic dilation, which is really a very large stretch. So in comparison to the at most 20 millimeter stretch that can be done with the balloon or the standard bougie, pneumatic dilation is done at 30, 35, sometimes even 40 millimeters, so almost double in size. And that's why it has, to ten, has an effect on the muscle. And then there's something called a myotomy, which is where we actually cut the muscle layers. And that can be done in two ways, either during an endoscope, um, which is called a POEM or per, per oral, oral endoscopic myotomy. Um, and then the second way um, is surgically through a laparoscopic surgery, very similar to a gallbladder surgery, um, which is called a um, Heller myotomy. Um, then there is um, anatomical issues. So if you have a hiatal hernia that's causing a blockage or is causing reflux, that can be surgically repaired. Um, if you have portions of your other surgeries, you know, the most common would be a fund application in this area that are out of place, that are loose or that are too tight, um, you can redo that procedure as well. And then patient behavior, you know, I, I referenced um, the abnormal breathing and swallowing behavior. Um, there are a couple of minutiae to this, but overall, there's one central technique for treating these, which is a technique called diaphragmatic breathing, which is really focused on deep um, relaxed breathing where your abdominal muscles properly relax. And then there's the issue of central sensation processing and coping. Um, so we've talked about neuromodulators a little bit um, with the medications. Those also can have effect on the central sensation processing. But I think a really interesting area of both research and clinical use is a cognitive behavioral therapy um, and gut-specific hypnosis. So these are ways to sort of um, uh, teach us to disconnect 
the really negative symptom association that we may have with our esophageal symptoms. Um, and it's, it's been shown to be very effective. So um, what are the treatment outcomes? So, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about the individual treatment options, but why does it matter? Well, it matters because they work. You know, in large part, um, these esophageal treatments work. Um, and I've highlighted all the ones that work well in green. So proton pump inhibitors work well um, if the disease is an acid-mediated issue, whether that's typical acid reflux, you know, whether that's acid-related esophagitis or some other issue. Um, similarly, you know, the plumbing treatments are very effective. So dilating a stricture is very effective. Um, the treatments for the muscle, the lower esophageal sphincter particularly, are very effective. The Botox, the pneumatic dilation, or the myotomy. Um, anatomical therapies, you know, they, they do require surgery, but again, in the right um, situation where the diagnosis has been made correctly, that usually helps the patient's symptoms. Patient behavior, diaphragmatic breathing, again, if done properly for the right indication, is very effective. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis, as I mentioned, is very effective. So I show this because, you know, as a physician, we care about you as the patient and we want to make you better. Um, so we're doing this diagnostic testing, not just to do the testing, but because there is an endpoint. Um, we plan to put you on treatment and we really anticipate that that treatment is going to help you. I show a slide here on effective PPI or proton pump inhibitor use, uh, because this is sort of a, an area of misinformation, both amongst physicians and patients. Um, so all PPIs are not created the same. This chart shows you um, the sort of relative potency of the various PPIs in comparison to omeprazole. OE is omeprazole, which is Prilosec. So as you can see, pantoprazole, 20 milligrams, is only equal to four and a half milligrams of omeprazole. Um, you know, so it's almost you know 25% as effective. Um, and as you can see here, there's some other ones here like um, esomeprazole or Nexium, and then rubeprazole or Asifex, which are you know almost doubly potent, three to you know one and a half to two x more potent. So there is a difference in what PPI you're using. Um, so um, that's important um, to know as a patient when you're both taking and trying to understand whether or not your PPI is effective. I want to spend um, a little time on the surgical procedures uh, for acid reflux and specific, specifically a fund application. Um, you know, maybe one or uh, one or several of you have had a fund application um, in your lifetime, but this is really what's done. You know, and again, this is typically done for acid reflux. The idea here is that your lower esophageal sphincter barrier or the EGJ barrier is loose, and that's what's causing reflux to come up in your esophagus. So what they do is they tighten. They sort of take part of the stomach, the top part of the fundus, and they're able to wrap it around the bottom part of the esophagus. I kind of describe it to my patients as they make a turtleneck for you. Um, and they make it, you know, um, tighter than it originally was. Um, they try to make it not too tight um, by various means of measuring. Um, and outcomes for this procedure for reflux are very good. So we've talked about the medications. Um, and I've kind of given you a little bit of a prelude as far as the, the rationale for the diagnostic testing. But let's actually talk about the diagnostic targets. What are we trying to measure or evaluate? So it kind of goes back to that original slide as to what, what is wrong, um, because we actually have good diagnostic tests um, for, for, for the majority of the esophageal pathophysiologies. Um, so we can measure the ineffective function of muscles or the lower esophageal sphincter. We can look at inflammation or injury to the mucosa or the deeper layers. Um, we can look for anatomic abnormalities. Um, we can even measure abnormal patient techniques for swallowing and breathing. Um, and certainly we can look and diagnose tumors or cancer. And here again, um, I've highlighted the ones in green that we have effective diagnostic modalities for. So these are things we're actually good at picking up. Um, so we're good at detecting um, a muscular problem, whether that's peristalsis or an LES problem. Um, the test for that is manometry, which I'll talk about. We are good at evaluating the inflammation or injury to the mucosa. The test for that is endoscopy, and I'll show you some pictures. Um, we're good at looking at the anatomy. Um, again, that's oftentimes a combination of endoscopy and sometimes radiographic imaging, such as a barium esophagram or upper GI. Um, but with that combination, we can usually diagnose these problems. 
an abnormal patient technique for swallowing and breathing, we have become good at this um, with high resolution manometry um, with something called impedance. Um, and basically we can actually track the way air and liquid moves up and down your esophagus. And that can diagnose these disorders of rumination or supergastric belching. Tumors or cancer, um, we can diagnose with endoscopy or biopsy. Um, and then I've included um, what we're not good at here. And we're not good at measuring a couple of things. We're not good at measuring tissue level hypersensitivity. We have no way of knowing um, what level of distension or acid contents your esophagus can tolerate compared to someone else's. And we have no way of measuring central signal process. We have no way of knowing how you um, as the patient are going to um, sort of relate to this perception or relate to this symptom or this sensation and how you are going to process that. So now let's talk about the diagnostics that we have available at this time. And again, these are really focusing on motility, but they're, they're pretty comprehensive as far as looking at the esophagus. So first is upper endoscopy. This is the one that many of you may have had or at least heard of, very similar to a colonoscopy. You're, you, you're, you come into um, usually a, sort of a surgical center or um, an endoscopy unit. You're usually sedated in the United States. Um, and then the physician puts a camera um, that's attached to a flexible tube down your mouth and is able to look at the entirety of your esophagus um, and your stomach and first portion of your small intestine. Again, this is able to look at the lining of the esophagus, but not necessarily the deeper layers or the muscle layers. Then you have high resolution manometry. So I, I will have a slide specifically on this, but this is really a pressure catheter um, that is actually placed in your nose while you're awake you swallow it down, it goes down all the way to your stomach. And then once it's in place, it is able to measure the pressures um, in a very sensitive manner all up and down your esophagus. Um, and we, we test the, the function of the swallowing muscles by giving you, um, you know, some combination of liquid, whether that's um, sort of salt water consistency um, or something else. Um, and then oftentimes uh, solid foods, such as crackers, sometimes pudding, um, or other sort of viscous consistencies. Barium esophagram, another sort of familiar one, um, is when you drink barium contrast and the radi radiologist takes pictures of your um, esophagus. Um, and this really can tell us, you know, um, globally, whether there's a motility abnormality and also whether there's an anatomical abnormality. Um, and then there's a new test called the endoflip or functional lumen imaging probe. I'll spend some time on this as well, but this is um, uh, really a new um, modality which is done during the endoscopy um, to evaluate the motility. So while you're asleep and getting your upper endoscopy, there is a probe that can be placed um, down um, at the level of your lower esophageal sphincter and distal esophagus um, that can measure the motility or the muscle function of your esophagus. It does that by um, sort of slowly distending. And then when it distends, it engages the um, esophageal muscles, which then are supposed to contract under normal circumstances. So we can actually measure that really nicely and, and tell you whether or not you have a motility disorder of your esophagus. And then there's reflux testing. So there's a couple of different ways to actually measure the amount of acid coming up in your esophagus. So sort of the, um, I don't want to say old school, but the, the, the tr more traditional way is with a 24-hour transnasal catheter. So this is where um, usually right after your manometry, the manometry catheter will come out and then a thinner catheter, um, I usually tell patients it's, it's about the size of a, um, it's thinner than the mouse cord that connects to your computer. Um, that catheter will uh, be placed down your esophagus and into your stomach. Um, and this recorder, uh, this catheter rather has a pH sensor um, at the bottom. Um, and that sensor simply detects any acid that's coming up. Um, this will stay in place for 24 hours in your nose and then you'll bring it back the next day. Um, and then there's another test called a Bravo. And the Bravo is really a modification of this, but with a similar idea. Um, it is a wireless pH capsule. So during your endoscopy, we can hook on a sensor to the bottom of your esophagus, which does not have any wires attached to it. Um, and that sensor will record the acid that's coming up. Um, you have to wear a little monitor. Um, I say it's usually the size of a, one of the larger iPhones. Um, and you just bring that recording monitor back um, and that allows us to download the data. Um, the Bravo can be done anywhere from really 48 to 96 hours. So it gives you a little bit more information, two, three or four days of, of acid reflux data. So these are some pictures of what endoscopy can show us. 
Um, so you can see here four sort of drastically different pictures uh, of the mucosa, um, and this is what they mean. So the first picture is of a patient who has reflux esophagitis. So these sort of red streaks that are coming up from the distal esophagus are classic for reflux esophagitis, in this case, high grade. The second picture is of an esophageal stricture. So you might be able to appreciate that there's narrowing in this lumen. Um, that's what I mean by stricture. The, the lumen is narrow due to the scar tissue and fibrosis that has occurred there. This particular patient had a disease called lichen planus, which is a more rare disease, um, but strictures can be caused by a, a multitude of diseases. This third picture is of someone with eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and this shows the rings. Um, and actually, this is interesting. So uh, for those of you that are gastroenterologists in the audience, you might disagree. This, and, and I would agree with you, this patient actually does not have EOE. This is actually felinization of the esophagus, which can look like rings. Um, however, um, EOE rings do look very similar to that. Um, and then this is a picture of an ulcer in the esophagus. In this case, um, there was an impacted pill that was stuck there and caused the ulcer. So as you can see, endoscopy is very good at picking up mucosal diseases. Endoscopy can also tell us about motility disorders if they're severe. So this particular patient um, has advanced um, achalasia. Um, and you can see here that they have a, a very tight lower esophageal sphincter. And then they have dilation of the esophagus proximal to that. And they have um, really a lot of food and other debris that's essentially retained there. Um, on the barium esophagram, there's a finding called the bird's beak, which is where it looks like literally um, there's a pinch that looks like the beak of a bird. Um, that's classic for achalasia. Before we talk about um, esophageal manometry and reflux testing, I want to um, talk about GER or acid reflux, because of course, this is probably the most common disorder um, you know, that causes esophageal symptoms. Um, and I want to highlight there's a couple of different ways, a couple of different physiologies by which a patient can get GERD or GERD symptoms. Um, there's a defective anti-reflux barrier, diminished esophageal clearance, and then gastric factors. So when I say defective anti-reflux barrier, um, it's really what I've been alluding to all along is that that connection, um, the EGJ or esophagogastric junction, that can be loose. It can basically not do its job properly. And that can be due to a number of reasons. There are intrinsic sort of disease states. Um, one of them is scleroderma um, that can cause low lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So the nerves in that, uh, in that zone of the LES are not doing their job. And that causes low pressure in that zone, which predisposes the patient to reflux. A hiatal hernia can predispose a patient to reflux because a hiatal hernia basically pushes up onto the, the diaphragm and disrupts those otherwise intact ligaments um, that are providing tone or resistance um, at the level of the EGJ. Diminished esophageal clearance refers to really the way the esophagus squeezes any acid back down. So when, esoph uh, when acid comes up into the esophagus, whether that's during the day, um, even at night to some degree, um, one of the mechanisms for the esophagus is to squeeze it right back down and therefore not have any injury. But there are diseases that, call, that cause defective peristalsis where that peristalsis is weak. And so the acid stays around for a long time. And then there's some um, diseases that have a sort of lower production of saliva and saliva can neutralize acid as well. Um, so diseases such as Sjogren's syndrome where there's inadequate production can cause um, higher levels of acid as well. And then there are gastric factors. Um, so if you can imagine, um, if the stomach is what's making acid, um, if there's a pathophysiology where there's more acid made in the stomach or there's more acid available at any given time, that just makes it uh, more likely that that will reflux up in the esophagus. So if you have a condition called delayed gastric emptying where stuff is not moving through the stomach, acid is accumulating, that will predispose you to getting esophageal reflux. Um, Similarly, if you have actually a blockage at the end of the stomach, let's say due to a scar tissue or an ulcerated area, that can predispose you to having esophageal reflux as well. Um, and so with GERD, uh, what I like to do is really figure out which of these things is driving um, the, the acid um, exposure in the exit. So, you know, if it's a hiatal hernia, fixing the hernia usually does the trick. Um, if it's a low LES pressure, um, you know, sometimes surgery with an anti-reflux procedure can help, um, but sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes they need high-dose PPI therapy. So those are just examples, but it's really important to target the physiology.
So um, this is what a high resolution manometry catheter looks like um, in a little bit more of a close up view. Um, so you can see it's this kind of copper coated wire. Um, it has many segments, you know, 36 to be exact. Um, that record pressure. Um, and as I said, this is a very sophisticated and accurate device for measuring pressure. Um, and what, what it does is, you know, when you swallow, it um, detects the force that the muscles are exerting on the catheter and it records this as a pressure. This is what the output looks like from a high resolution study. This is one swallow and really a normal swallow. So you can see, um, you know, the top part here is the upper esophageal sphincter. So this is up here in the pharynx or the throat. Um, and when you swallow, this is the first part that relaxes. Then the food bolus passes through the esophagus and you can see the esophageal peristalsis. So there are a couple of different segments of this. This sort of bottom segment is the larger segment of smooth esophageal muscle that's contracting. And this is what it's supposed to do. It's sort of supposed to squeeze um, sequentially from top to bottom such that the food bolus will get pushed down. And then at the bottom here, you can see this green impression initially, which then relaxes as the, the body peristalsis. And this is the lower esophageal sphincter. So the idea here is that as the body pushes the liquid or food bowls down, just at the right time, the LES needs to relax to let it through into the stomach. So this is a normal high resolution monitor. These are a couple of examples of the really the prototypical disease of esophageal dysmotility or achalasia. Um, so achalasia refers to um, a disorder where the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax properly to let um, swallowing happen. And then it also has a defective peristalsis. So both the squeezing in the body and also the LES are not functioning properly. There are a few different flavors of achalasia. Um, and now sort of in the, not necessarily very recently, but in the last decade or so, we've, we've classified this as type one, type two, and type three achalasia. And really these are differences probably more for us to understand as physicians. Um, but what they have to do with is uh, the pattern of uh, body dysmotility. So as you can see in type one here, um, the sort of body of the esophagus is all blue. There's really no contraction going on. Um, it's quite possible that this represents more of the sort of advanced achalasia stage. Type two is when there actually is a little bit of squeezing of the body, it's just not normal. So you can actually see these green pressure bands here. These are from the, um, the food or liquid getting sort of squeezed um, with the esophageal body muscles. And then type three is a very sort of jarring and um, easy to pick up disease because you have these really hyper intense contractions um, in the body of the esophagus, which are really discoordinated or you know, premature as we term them medically. Um, and so the reason this classification is important is because types one and type two only need therapy to the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and then you know, the body of the esophagus sort of drains with gravity after that. Type three, however, requires not only a cut of the lower esophageal sphincter, but also a cut of the spastic segment of the body. So you'll oftentimes have what we call a long myotomy, um, which is really important for, for good patient outcomes. Um, this is sort of a schematic and, and an actual picture of some of the reflux testing. So I had mentioned um, a pH impedance catheter. So um, uh, the pH part of it, um, is this blue sensor right here. So that, again, this is a catheter that's placed after the manometry um, that has acid reflux sensors as sort of one part. Um, and then the yellow or gold on this diagram is actually showing impedance. I'm gonna show you some pictures of impedance in, in one second here. But um, really what impedance is doing is it can actually measure the flow of liquid or gas through the esophagus up and down. So not necessarily acid or pressure, but just the flow it can detect um, as a segment is being um, passed through by air. This is a picture of a Bravo. So this is what the wireless capsule that I mentioned, that's what it looks like once we deploy it endoscopically. It's very small. This is obviously a magnified view. And this is the data output that you would get. Um, this is a pH study only. So this is only the acid. So um, what you see in these red tracings here is the actual pH. So, you know, it could go really anywhere from, from three to seven, eight, nine, you know, and you can see this, this line in the middle is highlighting the range of abnormal. So anything with a pH less than four is abnormal in the esophagus. And all these red zones here are time points when the esophagus is exposed to acid. 
And the really nice thing about these studies, and you will appreciate this if you've ever had one, is um, we actually track the symptoms and even the meals and the positioning of the patient. So you can see, for instance, right here, um, let's see if we'll do that. You can see that this patient reported heartburn right here. Um, and you can see that that correlates with an acid reflux event. Um, we can also see that um, patients have, for instance, more reflux when they're lying down um, or after meals or during meals. And again, all of these things ultimately tie back to that physiology of GERD um, and treating that. So it's very helpful information. So these are some examples of what impedance can show us. So on the left here um, is a sort of tracing of, of an impedance in uh, a patient who is having supergastric belching. So impedance in this case goes up uh, when air is passing through that segment of the esophagus. So the idea is, is that with supergastric belching, the, the problem is the patient is swallowing air. Oftentimes it's in response to some you know, physiologic stimulus or, or something, uh, but it is an abnormal behavior nonetheless. And so what happens is you swallow the air and rather than going back down and going through your stomach, it actually has to come right back up. Um, and that's what this impedance is showing you. So you can see that the, um, the air tracing, you can see it going up the impedance um, in the top sensors, and then it travels down to the bottom sensors, but then it comes right back up. So that's what supergastric belching looks like. Very easy to diagnose on manometry and even pH impedance. This is in contrast to what we call a gastric belch. A gastric belch is you know, a burp, a physiologic burp. When you have air that comes from your stomach and releases up through your esophagus. And the difference is, is that that's what I call a bottom-up phenomenon. So you can see the impedance tracing um, showing the air moving up in this case. Um, again, very easy to pick up on our testing. The right uh, picture here is of a patient who has a rumination disorder. So this is actually a different test. This is an antriduodenal manometry, um, but the idea is the same, actually. This is a pressure plot in this case. Um, and with rumination, what's happening is the patient is squeezing his or her abdominal muscles abnormally um, when either they're eating or after eating or even sometimes not associated with eating. And that increase of abdominal pressure basically forces the contents of the stomach up to the esophagus. Um, patients often report that food that they just ate comes up, you know, really partially or not digested at all. That's the classic history. Um, and rumination is treated uh, with uh, diaphragmatic breathing very well, so it's important to diagnose. And what you see here is that the pressure um, goes up simultaneously in all the segments. So in all the segments of the stomach, the duodenum, and, and the esophagus, you will see simultaneous pressure increase, or what we call R waves. So that's how we diagnose that. So the functional lumen imaging probe, um, you know, I, got a, I get a lot of interest from both patients and other providers about this new technology. Um, so the functional lumen imaging probe, or FLIP, is that sort of balloon that I mentioned that we can place during an upper endoscopy um, distended and then see how the esophagus responds. Does the esophagus contract properly or not? Um, and these are sort of pictures of what we may see with that. So this is a normal flip study um, where it, it almost looks similar to manometry where the um, esophageal muscles are squeezing, again, sort of top to bottom, and you see that slant, and then you can see the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter kind of opens or turns blue. So that's normal. And these other three um, studies are abnormal. This study is someone who has achalasia. So you can see this high pressure or uh, sorry, low diameter band, which is the lower esophageal sphincter. It never opens and there's never any peristalsis here. This patient, um, the LES doesn't open. There are a couple of sort of contractions here, but they're not the sort of normal repetitive. Repetitive contractions that we're supposed to see. Contractions actually go backwards. Um, and so that's another sort of abnormal pattern that we could see. So we're still learning about FLIP, but I think so far we've proven that it is actually very good at detecting um, the major motor disorders and, and might be more sensitive for detecting um, other things that are relevant to your symptoms of the patient. So that's um, really the end of the talk. I wanted to point you to some future directions for our field of esophageal motility disorders. Um, and these are both you know, things that I'm passionate about, a lot of my mentors are passionate about, and a lot of my colleagues as well.
So one is improving comfort of diagnostic patient, diagnostic testing for patients. So manometry, pH impedance, anything that's going in your nose, it's uncomfortable. There's no way around it. I would say from my clinical experience that um, 10%, if not 20% of patients cannot tolerate those procedures. So we need to have um, additional tests that can give us the same information. Um, that's one use of the flip, one use of the bravo, which we use a lot at Emory. Another uh, future direction is detecting minor motor disorders and hypersensitivity. So I had mentioned, you know, we have a lot of good ways to measure the plumbing of the esophagus and looking at things sort of endoscopically, but we're not good at me measuring some of the more minor um, motility disturbances. And I think that, um, you know, those are areas that need to be explored. And then um, another important thing is really developing some scalable treatments for central processing and behavioral abnormalities. Um, so as I alluded to, a lot of patients um, could benefit from treatment of sort of the brain-gut interaction. Um, and those treatments are hard to provide because at least at the moment, they involve you know, um, a gut-specific trained person, a GI psychologist who can deliver the hypnosis or deliver the cognitive behavioral therapy. And we really need to sort of um, make those available to a broader a patient population. Um, and that's you know, something that's being um, worked on as well, both with virtual platforms and other modalities. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction with our field. And I hope that as patients, you all will be able to um, you know, um, get the benefits of those as far as your outcomes in the future. So that is it. Um, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it.